I would like to uh, introduce the first speaker today. So Alex McDonald is the director and vice chair at SNEA Europe. He's been active in the Storage Networking Industry Association since joining member company NetApp in 2005, after more than 30 years in a variety of roles in the software industry. With a background in software development, support sales, and a period as an independent consultant, Alex is now part of NetApp's Office of the CTO that supports industry activities and promotes technology and standards-based solutions. He is co-chair of the SNEA Solid State Storage Initiative and Cloud Storage Initiative and vice chair of the Ethernet Storage Forum. Please join me in welcoming Alex. Thanks, Jake. Thank you. I'm, I'm very hot today. Uh, I'm, I'm not built for speed, and I'm really not built for these temperatures either. I come from a country where the average temperature is about 15 degrees lower than it is outside this front door. How many of you are sweating bricks? <laughs> I've sweated a whole town. Huge. Anyway, before we go any further, I just want really quickly, before we, we, need, we need to get some physics out of the way first, because a little bit of this presentation is about physics, and I forgot to bring it. I occasionally bring it. Who knows who Grace Hopper was? She ended up as, uh, I think, uh, Rear Admiral in the US Navy. She was promoted that many times. But Grace Hopper was uh, the inventor of COBOL, uh, or one of the inventors of COBOL, and, and Grace Hopper used to do presentations and, and, and seminars, and she used to hand out a piece of wire during her presentations, and I was the lucky recipient of one of her pieces of wire, which I keep at home and occasionally bring to seminars. And the piece of wire is slightly shorter than this. It's about that long, 11 inches. And Grace Hopper used to point out that that 11 inches is the amount of time it takes light to travel, sorry, it's one nanosecond for light to travel that distance. One nanosecond is 11 inches in a vacuum of light. It's actually a bit longer than that in a piece of wire, probably about this length, actually. The AV guy was kind enough to give me this. I think I'm going to take it. It looks like a really high-quality HDMI cable. <laughs> <clears throat> but that's about a nanosecond. So I'm going to be talking about milliseconds, microseconds, and nanoseconds, orders of 1,000. So if a nanosecond is 11 inches, a microsecond is 1,000 times longer, and a millisecond is a million times longer. And I just want you to keep that in mind as I talk about the scale of what we're going to be talking about in terms of non-volatile memory, which is a new memory technology. Keep in mind Grace Hopper's 11-inch wire. Uh, is it, does anyone else have an 11-inch piece of wire? No, thought not. They're rare. I'm very really fortunate in having, I've had a, a fantastic career, as you can probably tell, I'm quite old. And I've had a fantastic career, but that was one of the highlights, was meeting Grace Hopper. So, who are SNEA? The Storage Networking Industry Association are a group of like-minded uh, people, mainly from the storage industry, uh, who are interested in promoting and supporting uh, storage and networking. And we've got about 160 member companies, about 2,500 active contributing members, and 50,000 ITN users and storage pros worldwide that we talk to on a regular basis. And what do we do? We do a bunch of things, you know, data in the cloud, storage management. We talk about next-gen data centers. But the one thing I want to talk about today is persistent memory, and this new technology, this new class of uh, uh, memory that we're uh, beginning to see uh, developed and delivered. But we're quite, quite wide-ranging, you see. There's quite a lot that SNEA do. So I'm going to talk a little bit about persistent memory. There's an awful lot I'm not going to talk about, by the way. I mean, this, this topic is huge. But I am going to give you pointers at the back end about where to go to get further information. So a quick overview of persistent memory. You'll notice I am not going to use the words storage class memory. How many of you have heard of storage class memory? A few? Forget it. Persistent memory. OK? Because storage class memory makes memory sound like storage, and everyone thinks storage is really boring. It isn't. It's the most fascinating subject on God's earth. But unfortunately, it's not the right way to think about this stuff. This is persistent memory. And I'm going to talk about the non-volatile memory programming model. And that, again, is an unfortunate terminology, NVM, because we tend to add 
I don't know, how many of you would be tempted to add an E on the end of that, NVMe? Oh, dear, didn't mean to say that. NVMe is an actual technology that uses non-volatile memory, NVM. Call it persistent memory. Think of NVM as persistent memory. And then I'm going to talk about non-volatile DIMMs, a little about the physical layout, what you can get today, and then some conclusions and pointers as to the future. So, what is non-volatile memory? What is persistent memory? It's like memory, except that it remembers where it's been, it, it, what, what's been stored in it. How many of you remember the IBM System 360? Yeah, some really old guys in here. Look, there's a guy with a beard at the back. Hurrah! There's a, there's a man who would actually know who Grace Hopper was when she was really young. That's you and I. The thing about the IBM System 360 was it was built around a, several new technologies, one of which was core memory. Core memory were little ferrite rings, little tiny little ferrite rings through which people wired, put three wires. There were three wires through each of these tiny little ferrite rings. They were actually hand-threaded. Quite an amazing piece of technology. But it had one attribute that we've kind of forgotten. It was persistent memory. In other words, when I stored into memory, or I did a store into memory, when I turned off the power, that value persisted, even when the power went away, when the system fell over. And when I rebooted the system, or IPL'd it, as we did in mainframe days, then that memory would still have the original contents. Which is OK, because persistent memory in those days we were running what I call non-antagonistic workloads. On a mainframe, you were running workloads where everyone was your friend. Well, OK, they consumed CPU time when you wanted to and resources when you wanted to, but you were all friendly. We were all in the same boat together. Nowadays, we're running antagonistic workloads. If you think of what's going on in the cloud and things like, for instance, um, the, the, the problems that we've had with things like Spectre, you know, a real bug in terms of being able to determine what other things are doing on our processes simply by timing cache loads. You know, so we've got issues about antagonistic workloads. So persistent memory, you can probably think to yourself, well, there must be a lot of issues to do with persistent memory, and you'd be right. Security is one of them. Encryption is another. But I'll, I'll try and discuss these as we go through. Persistent memory is making big inroads at the moment. We're already beginning to see it in terms of um, flash. Now, persistent memory is not necessarily flash, by the way. Flash we tend to consume uh, as um, almost like disk. We build block structures out of it because flash is an unusual property. Flash is only block addressable, whereas persistent memory is byte addressable. Thank you. See, Michael Loros is from SNEER. He's actually the director of SNEER. He's up the back prompting me. Byte addressable. And that's a big difference between flash, which is only addressable in really big blocks, and persistent memory, which is actually byte addressable. Now, that's a, that's a big difference, and we'll, we'll cover that as we go through it. But there are a variety of technologies, and we're beginning to see more and more persistent memory, and more and more flash as well. Flash is the, is, is the technology of the day at the moment, the technology du jour. People are consuming flash in huge quantities. But persistent memory is beginning to become apparent. You're going to see more and more persistent memory systems. So it, persistent memory bridges this gap between DRAM and flash and increases system performance, obviously, because it's a lot faster. It's faster in two ways. One, it's got better bandwidth, so we can address it much more broadly. And two, it's got much better latency. And I just want to talk a little bit about the latency, the access times. Remember. Grace Hopper's 11 inches per nanosecond. Well, we're going to be talking about memory that responds in hundreds of nanoseconds at best. OK, so that's like less than 100 feet. What's that in meters? 30? Somewhere around that. And I know this from experience, because we're building at NetApp systems that are attempting to use persistent memory and we have distance problems. We have distance problems. The memory needs to be pretty close to the processor because that 100 feet is just too far, far too far. So you need to think about these in order, order of uh, magnitude. And here we've got something that's in you know, 
the milliseconds, magnetic, the traditional disk is in milliseconds. It's about seven milliseconds for the average latency on, on a disk, roughly, thereabouts, three and a half, something like, depends on the spin rate. But with persistent memory, we're talking about microseconds to nanoseconds. For DRAM, we're talking about nanoseconds, and for actually in the cache of the processor itself, low nanoseconds, very low nanoseconds, tens of less. You can see there's this hierarchy. And again, I just want to point out to those of you who are really interested in maths, this is all logarithmic. Remember, you're multiplying pretty big numbers by pretty big numbers here, or dividing pretty, big, uh, pretty small numbers by even bigger numbers. So these, these are logarithmic. And I can't stress the difference between 100 nanoseconds and 100 microseconds. It's, 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 a, it's huge. In fact, it's a thousand times huge. So just be aware of that when you're looking at these kind of technologies. So how do we write applications for persistent memory? Well, we've done it for, for a number of years. We, we've assumed to a large degree that every time we do a load and store to memory, that somebody's going to remember the load and store we did. And uh, the best possible outcome is that all the loads and stores that we do and all the work that we do eventually uh, become saved in some way. But what we, what we tend to think of in terms of compute at the moment is about opening files or block devices sucking in gobs of data, processing it, doing something with it, and then writing it back out again. And that's the way we tend to think of the way applications should work. They open something. You can, you can almost see the code at the moment, can't you? You open something, they read something, they crunch it a bit, and they write something. And that seems to be most processing, most applications. But what we need is a different view of programming for persistent memory that I'll try and cover in, in, in a second. But basically, we, we, what we did was we, we came up with this NVM programming model, non-volatile programming model, where the industry got together and determined a way of using this new technology that everybody can get access to. And uh, it, it's, if you like, it, it's, it's, it's a, a route map to how to go about using non-volatile memory. So the technical work groups that we have inside SNIA, the non-volatile memory programming work group decided to go out there and talk about hardware that includes solid state drives and persistent memory that spans both applications and the OSs that support them because we need changes in the OS to support persistent memory. It may not appear to be obvious, but you, you do actually need changes and create this NVM programming model. The reason for OSs, by the way, is really quite simple. If you think about a load in a store as opposed to block I.O., what do you do when you go out and do block I.O.? You go out and you talk to a device, you wait for a bit, and that bit could be microseconds to milliseconds currently. You wait for a bit you pull, as the data is pulled back in, and then you restart. So what we tend to do with processes, we tend to switch state. We let somebody else have a go on the CPU while you're waiting for your I.O. to happen. And we do this scheduling trick to make sure that it looks like you've got the entire CPU to yourself when, in fact, you're sharing it amongst a bunch of process applications, tasks, whatever they might be. When you're talking about persistent memory, the, the, the time it takes to load and store is so short that a con what we call a context switch, in other words, moving from one process to another, is too long. It's bigger than the amount of time it takes to do the load and store. So, we don't do the context switch. So that's a change in the first place. We're not waiting anymore. So we have to take account of that in the operating system. As an example, that's just one thing that we need to do. So the NVM programming model was version 1.2. You can find it out on sneer.org uh, on that um, link. And I presume these slides are going to be published somewhere, are they? Yes, they are. So you'll be able to find that. And what these do is they expose a couple of things. First of all, some block and file features to applications so we can take advantage of persistent memory. And also a memory map for persistent memory so that we can actually treat this stuff like memory and do loads and stores against it. And it's a programming model. It's not an API. In other words, it doesn't tell you what calls to write, but it tells you what those calls should look like should you be developing software to access persistent memory. So it's, it's a model, not an API. And that was quite deliberate. So we've got this four modes that we can use. We've got a file mode where we can treat the thing like a file. Do you know the difference between file and block? 
but I'll, I'll explain really quickly just in case. So block, what you're doing is you're going and getting blocks of data, like you know, 4Ks worth of data at a time. And you address the device via block number. So I go and get block 10 and I get 4Ks worth. A file is like a block device, except that the block is only one byte long and I can address it by the individual byte. But I'm tending to get quite big chunks because addressing a file at the byte level is, it can be relatively inefficient. So we've got files which are, as you would expect, you know, usual thing of a text file, that's, that's what a file looks like. And then we've got block, which are just chunks, chunk data. And then we've got two ways of dealing with this persistent memory rather than as I.O. So in other words, we can do loads and stores on it. We can do it file by file mapping, by memory mapping, or we can treat it as a volume, a space in our address space that allows, to ad allows us to address this stuff as memory. So on the left, we've got disk-like activities, and on the right, we've got memory-like activities. Oh. So block and file modes use I.O. type semantics. So what do we do when we're doing I.O.? We do an open, read, write, update, close. Perhaps the occasional delete and rename, but that's, you know, that's, that's, the, that's if you like, the kind of file mode I.O. that we do. And block mode, we simply mount the device and then address the blocks and then unmount the device. And the volume and persistent memory modes allow us to do loads and stores. So I can actually load from persistent memory into a register and then store from a register back into persistent memory. And the processor makes the software wait for that data. But as I was saying, the wait is so short doing a context switch, switching to another process, probably isn't what you want to do. And the persistent memory model uh, actually allows for that. So we've got this block mode. There's atomic writes. Everyone should know what atomicity is. One of the things that's, that, that struck me recently is um, we're at the limit of what you can do with serial processing. Go look at, for instance, the speed of Intel's latest and greatest creations. In terms of the processing power you've got, there's not been that much change in the last five years. The incremental changes have been relatively small. They're certainly not orders of magnitude. They are relatively small. And what this is doing is for storage, for persistent memory, is literally orders of magnitude. Around about three, it's a thousand times faster than what we've been accustomed to. So that's a thousand times faster I.O. And there are some quite amazing figures. For instance, I have seen storage systems doing block I.O. doing three million I.O.s a second out of one nine, you know, one U unit. Three million IOs a second. I mean, that's just... You know, an individual SATA drive can do 300 IOs a second if you're really lucky. And here we've got something doing three million. You know, it's, it's, it's... If your stagger's not staggered, it should be. It's staggering. And then you've got file mode, which is for file-based applications. And again, atomic reads and writes. So we're actually guaranteeing consistency. I'm not going to go too much into atomicity, but it's a, it's a fairly large subject. And then you've got volume and file mode is persistent memory. So effectively what I'm doing there is I can actually directly address this persistent memory device as memory. It's actually on the memory bus. It's not on a PCIe bus. It's not on a SAS bus. It's not on a, an external bus at all. It's on the memory bus. And I can address this stuff as memory. So the technical work group has been doing quite a bit of work as well on threat models because we live in a time when antagonistic workloads are incredibly commonplace and threats are very commonplace as well. So we've got a white paper coming out that discusses approaches to things like encryption. How do you encrypt when you're byte level addressable? I mean, it's a, you know, it's a big issue. How you go about uh, making sure that you can't take DIMMs from one machine and simply because they're persistent walk over to another machine and plug them back in and read somebody else's data. So all those kind of issues we're addressing in that threat model. And we're also talking about remote access because there's one thing that's really nice about storage people and storage 
is we like to share. We love sharing with you. We really want you to have access to this stuff. And if you've got persistent memory that's trapped inside a, a process, a you know, inside a server box, you need to get access to it in some way. So we're going to see more persistent memory over fabrics, so high availability over a fabric like, for instance, I don't know, TCP IP or over a fiber channel, whatever it might be. So some persistent memory over fabrics. So it covers the security, remote persistent memory via RDMA, and higher level semantics as we learn more. We're learning an awful lot about this stuff as we go along. It's incredibly useful. But there are little wrinkles in it that we're discovering on a regular basis. Particularly from a performance aspect, funnily enough. Because it's quite, it, it, it modifies workload characteristics so dramatically. So, what's on the application horizon? What we're looking at? So, until recently, what we had was the bit on the left hand side. You're the application, the file system, or a, or a block based device, uh, some kind of disk driver, an SSD out the back end. Uh, who of you are, 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 are convinced? that spinning rust, old traditional disks are dead. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of with you there. Tapes, everyone thought were dead, but they're not quite dead. Disks, I think, are deader than tapes, funnily enough. I think SSDs are getting to the point where the cost performance profile and capacity profile as well is such that we're going to see fewer and fewer disk drives. And there's less and less disk drive technology innovation taking place. We're certainly not going to see a factor of 10 at a traditional spinning rust. So I think that the fact is that we're going to see much more in terms of SSDs. But the next question I have for you, if a spinning disk has a latency that's measured in milliseconds, what does an SSD have? It's got a latency measured in, at best, tens to hundreds of microseconds. Remember Grace Hopper with a piece of wire? We're nowhere near down to 11 inches. Persistent memory, on the other hand, has latency that's measured in high hundreds of nanoseconds currently. I mean, that's a big factor. So what we're going to see is the first application is going to be this persistent memory middleware. We're going to build file systems on top of persistent memory. And file systems are the best way to go. If you think, if, if any of your programmers here, you'll know that about memory mapping, where you, f you map a file to memory. And that's exactly what we'll do here. We'll memory map. The next step we're going to see are persistent memory libraries. Now, Intel have done a lot of work here, and they've released a, um, a set of libraries that allow you to do persistent memory programming. And I'll point you at it later, but it's the, the, the website's pmem.io. And what that is is a persistent memory library that allows you not only to use, you, you know, you can build not only persistent memory file systems, you can also directly access the persistent memory through this persistent memory library. And there are emulators there as well, so you can actually emulate using uh, your existing DRAM as a sort of persistent memory while you test out uh, these library applications. And then the third horizon is going to be the compiler recognizing the fact that there is a separate class of memory called persistent memory. And we're going to have compilers where you'll be able to write applications that directly access persistent memory through the language itself rather than having to use an intermediate library. So what's an NVDIMM? This is the first incarnation of persistent memory. And there are two types currently, NVDIMM-N and NVDIMM-P. NVDIMM-N is basically DRAM backed by some form of solid state device. So it actually looks like main memory, except that it's persistent, because any time there's a power down, what it does is it dumps all the memory off to DRAM on the same chip, which allows you, when you boot back up, to move all that information from the uh, flash part of the, of the chip back into memory. So it looks like persistent memory. It's quite expensive, <laughs> to be quite honest, because it's using two quite expensive technologies. DRAM, which is expensive, and uh, Flash, which is relatively expensive, but not quite as expensive. But you've got that not quite as expensive cost on top of the already expensive cost to make it even more expensive. So we're seeing a little of this. And basically, it's byte addressable. 
And it's very fast indeed, and it is persistent. And that, that makes it really interesting for building really, really big databases, for instance. Really, really big, fast databases. Incredibly fast databases. You know, fast as the speed of light minus a bit because it's having to go through electrons. It's, it's, it's really fast. And then we've got NVMDIMP, which is persistent memory in its own right. And we're beginning to see develops in this, uh, developments in this. And this will be a persistent memory without DRAM. You're directly addressing the persistent stuff. And there's a specification being published for this. And I believe there are some engineering parts out there. But Intel people could probably confirm that. Are there engineering parts out there for NVMDIMP? Yes, I'm getting the thumbs up. A bit like the Roman Gladiator thing, you know. Kill him. Get him off. So there's various technologies that, that, that we're going to see for persistent memory, all the way from you know, FE RAM, MRAM, RERAM. There's a whole bunch of stuff, 3D crosspoint. Currently, some of this, or most of this, is being used to support SSD. So you're saying, for instance, in Intel case, a 3D crosspoint is being used as a, a backstop for it. You, the, the, SSDs, you know, we're actually building SSDs out of it currently. You're going to see persistent memory coming along. The densities are quite or relatively low at the moment, but they're bigger than DRAM. And I have personally seen a 16 petabyte flash memory based box. Okay? That's a lot. Uh, it's a bit of a fake, actually, because it's, it's, it's made out of various parts that just don't exist outside of labs, to be quite honest. But these things will get quite big. You're going to see very large address ranges. Actually, I think 16 terabytes is beyond the capability or close to the capability of most of the chipsets that we have at the moment, because although we have 64-bit processors, um, processors only address 48 bits out of that 64. So there's a, there's a way to go yet. The use cases, well, you can think of them yourself, can't you? What you wouldn't give for something that looked like memory, but was almost infinitely large, you could store entire, for instance, genomic databases inside a single in-memory in database. You know, you're, you're talking the ability to crunch this stuff with incredible speed. In fact, one of the big problems of having this much persistent memory close to the processor is how you get it there in the first place. Okay, it's got to come from somewhere. Data just doesn't suddenly magic itself out of thin air. It has to come over this stuff, which is why we're beginning as an industry to move away from wire, which you can get about two-thirds of the speed of light, to fiber optic, where you can get close to the speed of light in a vacuum. Okay, so this stuff, you know, what we consider to be the best medium for transmitting data, wire, is no longer good enough because of the latencies involved. Traditional databases, log acceleration, for instance, um, logging and log-based stuff, like log-based databases, log-based file systems, anything that does logging is a, a candidate for persistent memory because it's so fast. Uh, tiering, using it in a tiered environment. I'm not a big fan of tiering. Uh, you know, as a, as a storage vendor, what I prefer you do is put all your data on the fastest and most expensive kit we sell. So I'm not a big fan of tiering, but hey, if you want to do tiering, you can do tiering with this stuff. And, and HPC. Because one of the things with HPC, frustratingly, is anybody in the HPC environment will tell you, when, when it goes down, getting it back up again to where you left off is really, really difficult. And this kind of approach makes it much easier to get back onto your feet again. How am I doing for time, by the way? Am I over? Yes, yes okay. I'm nearly finished. So we've got infrastructure changes I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'll leave these, as I say, you can read these slides yourself. The two I want to talk about are Linux, where the kernel now supports NVDMN. There's OS support in there. Something called DAX. Amazingly, Microsoft have also got the same facility in Windows. And guess what it's called? DAX. Wow. Hey, two major technologies where the name actually agrees. How wonderful is that? Uh, so NV NVM DIM, I'll go back just one slide. There's uh, a variety of support in here for file systems as well, things like ext4. And there are new file systems coming along, like uh, a file system called ZooFS, ZUFS. 
Um, Windows has got NVDIMM support. Uh, you can see the figures there at the bottom. You know, 4K random writes with NVMDIMM as, as a block gets you 187. Use it with DAX, which accelerates it. And hey, presto, 1.6 million. And that's, well, that's, well, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's an awful lot faster. And the latency is way down. You can see it's in the low mic, it's in, it's in, the, it's in the nanosecond range. So the summary, pmem.io, go there and have a look about what uh, is being done in terms of persistent memory. Um, nobody's forcing specific APIs, by the way, so this is just a library that allows you access through a one-night API to persistent memory technologies. There are various other bits and pieces that, uh, of work that are taking place. The technology work group, by the way, is open to people. If you want to join it, please feel free. Uh, we'd love to see more people working on this, uh, particularly from the development perspective. Um, key takeaways, data is, has always been important. Data is something that you need to take a huge amount of care of, yet traditionally we've been relatively careless about where we do our compute on data, and we tend to do it away from where the data is stored. So we end up with the issue of moving large quantities of data. And if you think about where a lot of data is being generated these days, it's being generated at the edge, and yet we, have, we want to compute it at the center. So we're having to move lots of data from the edge to the center. Persistent memory allows us to do much more at the edge. If we can persist data in large quantities at the edge and do a compute there, then that's, that's, that's a really positive forward step. Um, Particularly when you think of things like, as well, uh, we've had a, a, an obsession over the years with backup. How many of you do backup? How many of you do restores? It's a different question. It's actually got a different answer. And this kind of thing changes the way you think about your data. You know, having persistent memory changes the way you think about backup and restore, for example. Because it's becoming less and less practical, by the way, to move these quantities of data around. Even in a modern data center, it can get quite crippling. So you're invited to contribute. Please come along to our SNEER uh, persistent memory uh, technical work groups if you've got anything to contribute. You may want to pick up on it if you're an application developer or a marketer. I like marketing people because they often drive ideas forward. They don't know why they're doing it, but often they do it without thinking about it. So if you're in marketing, get somebody to explain this to you, and, and you know, because it's really important. This is, this is one of the biggest changes taking place in our industry, and Michael Oros and I were, were at a meeting last week, um, at a SNEA Europe meeting, funnily enough, and I said to Michael, you know, this is one of the biggest changes in the last 20 years, and Michael said, no, in the last 60. This is, this is, this is a really, really huge change. It's an enormous, I can't explain how big a change this is. This is not like the invention of the disk drive. This is much more significant than that. Persistent memory is a technology that is going to fundamentally change the way that we think about data and persistence and storage and compute. It's, it's a real game changer. Thank you. <laughs>